Awesome. Well, if you would, I encourage you to turn your Bibles. Oh, grab your Bible first. I guess you can't turn it. Grab your Bible, open it, turn to 1 John. We're going to be in 1 John today, chapter 1. Hopefully finish chapter 1, and that, I mean, two weeks, one chapter? Hmm. Would you like me to go back and do more in 1 John? Uh, Okay. You know, I, I'm so thankful for this time. I'm thankful that you, you've chosen to be here for this, this time of worship together. And, you know, when we come to the scripture, this is, a, this is an act of worship also. Uh, singing is not the only way that we worship. We come to God in his word and we, we bow before him with humble hearts saying, Lord, I need you. Feed me, teach me, change me to be like you. And this is an act of worship that we we do in this preaching moment as we come to God's word. And so would you pray with me as we get started this morning and ask for God to help with that. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word. What a gift. What a gift it is to have your word. Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your message. That you would indeed draw us into a deeper and truer fellowship with you. I just pray, Lord, that that your word is understood today, that it would be grasped, and that we would walk closer with you. Lord, we ask for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. You might see the title up there, The True Fellowship with God. That's kind of the concept of what John is talking about in these next few verses and I use this term true fellowship because I think there are a lot of people and we, we've probably known them, uh, we've probably been them at certain times and in which we, we claim to know God, claim to have fellowship with God, but we realize there are other people, we look at them and they, what they have is really alive and sincere and we look at what we have and we go, man, I'm missing something. And, and I think there are certain just phases on the faith journey that we, we, we have these wonderful moments of intimacy and closeness with God. And as we continue down the path, maybe we're still doing the right things, but it just seems more distant. But in time, then there's, there's a closer development of a relationship as we go. And sometimes we need to be instructed on how to have that true fellowship. And I think indeed that is really what we want is to have real true fellowship with God. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of value. I don't think any of us would see a whole lot of value in going, well, I'm a Christian, I have fellowship with God, but not actually have fellowship with God. What would be the point of that? Right? And so many of you in the room today, and and hopefully uh, many that are even watching online, that we would say we are Christians who desire genuine fellowship with God. We are people who want closeness with God, and people who want to be involved in what God is doing. But what does that look like? What does it look like? How does one achieve and maintain true fellowship with God? And so this, this is what John is conveying in this passage we're going to look at, and I urge you to listen honestly and be willing to do some self-examination as you hear, am I doing these things or am I not doing some of these things in my relationship with God? And maybe if you're here today and you're not sure if you even want to be in a relationship with God, I urge you to hear what true fellowship is like based on God's word to us. So let's go to the text, 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read verses 5 through 10 in one chunk, and then we'll start to unpack it. Verse 5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. The hymn that he's referring to, the word of life, we've talked about last week is Jesus. So this message we have heard from Jesus, we declare to you, God is light. And there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And may God bless the reading and now preaching of his word. But we see in verse 5, John makes a really powerful statement. God is light. And then he elaborates on that in the next few verses. He elaborates on our relationship with the God who is light with five if-then statements. And so you'll notice in your bullets, and I always encourage you to follow along by taking notes and just trying to stay connected with what's being said. And if something strikes you, take a note of it and write it down. And even kids, there's kind of a special thing in the, bullet, in the pew in front of you. You can take some notes. You can draw some pictures, write some key words down. Just stay connected to what God is saying in this time. But usually I'll put in like three points, maybe four points, and kind of summarize some of the statements. But today or this week in preparation, every time I made a statement and a summarized statement, I felt like I was cheating and taking away from what John was saying. So instead of points, I just put the scripture verses up there today. And it's not because I was being lazy. I just want you to know. I, I wanted to put them in. I, really, this was, I believe faithfulness to God to just do what he wanted this morning. So you have those in there. And there's just a few key words. I'll let you fill in the blank to, to emphasize a few key words. But here's what he says, verse 5. He says, this is a message we've heard from him, the word of life, and we declare to you, God is light. What does this mean? I mean, what does it mean, God is light? Is he, is he the, the, the source of illumination? Yeah. Is he the creator of that which we call light? Yeah, absolutely. Because light, when we think about light for a second, light is that, that thing that illuminates. It makes things visible. Without light, we couldn't see. We couldn't see. And he's, and he's speaking both physically and metaphorically. We look at Genesis. We see that God created light that we, we perceive with our, our seeing, our senses there. But we also understand light in the sense of understanding comprehension. And apart from God, we have no understanding. We have no comprehension, particularly in the area of the gospel, but really anything. He created it all. But we usually understand light in relation to some kind of source. And so if you think about light from the sun, the sun would be a source of light, would it not? We don't turn the, the sun off like we would a light bulb that would also even, in a sense, be considered a source of light. But in this case, it is saying that God himself is the source of light. Every, every ability to see and perceive and have understanding comes from God. He is the source of it. Not a reflection of it, not a carrier of it, but the source of it. And in John, we saw this last week, I'm going to read it again. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the same author, I believe, writes, In him was life. And he's referring back to Jesus at this point. In Jesus was life. The source of life was in Jesus. Life in and of himself. He didn't need it to be granted to him. It didn't need to be created in him. It was in him. It was in God from eternity past to eternity present and eternity future. I, I, it's so hard to describe eternity, isn't it? But he says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. So that life was light. And that light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. So here we see that the light is life. Life is light. God is a source of light and life. And that's where we get fellowship from, is the one that is the source of light and life. There's absolutely no darkness in him, John says there in, in verse 5 of, of First John. There's no darkness in him. Darkness did you ever think about this? It's the absence of light. Darkness is not a measurable thing. Light is measurable. Darkness is when light isn't there. And, and you can prove this. If you, go, if you go deep into a dark cave, anyone ever been in a deep, dark cave? You ever been way down deep where there is no light at all? Like you, you had light to get there, but then you stop and then you, someone turns the lights out and there's no light from the outside anywhere and you can't see the hand in front of your face. It's terrifying. Like, please, someone be able to turn that switch back on, <laughs> right? Or my phone might, get me, might have enough flashlight battery to get me out of here. But that's it. You know, if, if you're in that complete darkness and someone pulls out a phone and it lights up, guess what? That room is illuminated with very little light. And, and even if someone is like just checking their watch and, and it lights up, you're like, oh, light. 
You see, darkness, it doesn't matter how little light there is, darkness can't crush it. It, can't, it doesn't take over light. Light takes over the darkness. And in God, there is absolutely no darkness in him. This is John's proclamation, his statement. God is light. And so this message, this idea that God is light is the foundation upon which this message continues, upon which John begins to speak of. Our relationship to the God who is light. Listen to what he says in verse 6. There just seem to be building statements, starting with this. If we say, we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. It's a conditional statement. You know, when you say, if you take out the trash, I'll give you a cookie. Right? Conditional. I'm not going to give you a cookie unless you take out the trash. It's kind of an if-then statement. If X is true, then Y is also going to happen or be true. And so John is saying, if it is true that we claim to have fellowship with God, a relationship, connection, intimacy with God, while we're walking in darkness, which remember, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him, but if we're saying, I have fellowship with light, but I'm walking in darkness, we're lying. And the truth isn't in us. Now, if we say we have fellowship with God, it just means that we're claiming to be a Christian. We, we claim to be someone who is in fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God. We, we claim participation in God's family, closeness with God. And John could have stopped here. This would have been interesting if he said, because think about this, humanly a God who is over all things, over the whole universe, who created us. For us, he could have stopped. If this, this could have been the truth, it's not, but it could have been. If he had just said, if we say we have fellowship with him, we're lying and not practicing the truth. He could have said that if, if that were true, but it's not true, so he didn't say it. But think about this. What an amazing privilege we have to be able to claim fellowship with God and actually have fellowship with God. That's what John's saying. You can have fellowship with God, but if you say you're having fellowship with God when you're not, you're lying. And the truth isn't in you. Yet you walk in darkness. To walk in darkness, let's be a little more clear on that, is to persist in sin. To persist in sin and, and ultimately self-rule, saying, I'm going to be in charge of me. I'm going to determine my way. I'm going to determine what is right and wrong for me. And maybe for you too. Because if your right and wrong interferes with my right and wrong, well, my right and wrong is better. Self-rule is not what we actually want. But it's what we grasp for in our human nature. It is, to, to walk in it means, it's not just that you, you dabble, that you, you've had an, a mistake here or there, you've made a, a decision to do wrong here or there. This is, this is a lifestyle, this is consistent practice of walking in darkness, to, to do that self-rule, to persist in the things that we desire rather than submitting ourselves to God. It, it's really when we live like there isn't a holy God in charge of the universe, and more importantly, of you and me, when we live like he doesn't exist. And if we're in darkness, then the source of light is not near us. Or it's being blocked out. And I know I've already said it, and I think it's so plain and simple to me, but you can't see well in the dark. In fact, if there's no light, you can't see at all. I mentioned a cave. I, the, my wife and I have toured a couple of caves and been down deep in a cave. I remember one in Idaho, and to get down to the spot that they took us to, there were places where they have steps and rails, and you can look over, and it's a couple hundred feet drop off. And then, you know, you wind down further and meander, you crawl through some tight spaces, and you get to the final little cavern where they stop and they show us how dark it is. They turn off the lights. And I'll tell you, when they turn off the lights, and I, when I say you're really hoping that they can turn the lights back on, it, it, like, it's for survival. You're like, I remember that pit and that narrow stairway. And like, if I miss and take the wrong step, I mean, I'm a goner. We need light to see, and, and, and if we have blocked God out, if we have, and now we really don't have the power to ultimately keep God out, but we can resist him, quench his spirit, even as Christ followers, though it should not be, we can't continue to walk in darkness. We can't see well in darkness. So 
we've already said light illuminates things, so if things aren't visible, we're going to stumble into things a lot. We're going to get hurt. We're going to hurt others. We're going to potentially die. And we'll certainly die spiritually. I believe that there are many in our world who claim to be Christians, but are walking in darkness. And what's worse is I don't think they're even aware. They think they're okay. Because they said a prayer when they were seven. He says that we claim to have fellowship. If we claim to have fellowship and we walk in darkness, we're lying, not practicing the truth. To speak or communicate something that is untrue, that's lying. It's pretending. Even includes the intent to deceive somebody, to deceive others, but you know, ultimately you're deceiving yourself. Our lives are communicating a message about what we believe. We can't help it. If we're walking in the light, the light's exposing our deeds and, and drawing us closer to him. We have fellowship with God. And, but if we're walking in darkness, we might fake some outward actions, but we, we aren't fooling anybody. And we certainly aren't fooling God. If we don't line up our actions and our words with what we believe, then we don't actually believe what we think we believe. And he says, you're not practicing the truth. The practice is to do something. It kind of has the same idea of walking in. It's, it's a consistent doing of something. You're not doing the truth. You're not functioning in truth with God in the light. We could reword the idea in more of a positive statement and just say, if you have fellowship with God, then you're practicing the truth. You're doing it. You're living it. And you know, when I mentioned that it's obvious, we, we lived in Washington State, as most of you know, uh, for almost a decade before we came down here, and we didn't get a whole lot of sunshine most of the year. <laughs> light. We didn't get a whole lot of light. What happens to people who live in a climate where you don't get a whole lot of sunshine? You get very pale, very white. And uh, when you interact with folks that went on vacation to Arizona or snowbirded to Arizona and you, you go to the pool in the summertime, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but it's obvious the difference that light makes. Our relationship to the light makes a difference in how we look. If we claim to spend a lot of time in the sun, but you're pasty white, Nobody's going to believe you. If you claim to spend a lot of time with God, but you walk in darkness, nobody's going to believe you. So let's examine ourselves. I think it's important to note and remember, remind you that John's audience is a church. It's churches, which are, which are filled with people that are fellowship, in fellowship with God. Christians, Christ followers, these are people who are at these churches, and this is who he's speaking this message to. So if we're people who have committed our lives to Christ, we are, we are those who have surrendered to God, who is light. Let us make sure we are walking in the light. He warns that we're liars and not practicing the truth if we claim fellowship with God, but are not actually living in fellowship with God. This should be a no-brainer should be because otherwise it's hypocrisy we're too satisfied with impressing somebody else than we are with actually having fellowship with God so brothers and sisters if we call ourselves Christians let's walk with God sincerely and not continue in darkness John continues Building on the if-then, this is the first if-then, now we get to the second in verse 7, he says, on the other hand, this is what I'm saying on the other hand, if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, that's to live consistent with God's standard his standards, his character, 
And if the Bible is the word of God, this is, if this is a message from God, then this message is light. And God chose to reveal himself through his word. And so we have this to understand how to walk in the light, how to be in the light. We need it. It's again another, another understanding of why do we encourage this at, at Lakeside so much to get in the Bible, to study the Bible, to know it deeply. Because this is how you know God. This is how you have fellowship with God. If you're trying to have fellowship with God apart from this, you are, you are very open to some misleading spirits that will try to convince you that you're worshiping and learning from God, but you're not. This is the way we know we're hearing from God when it matches up with his message, his word to us. To walk in the light again, it's that word, that, that same thing, to make it your practice, to make it your lifestyle. Is this your consistent practice? It doesn't say perfection in it. We'll get to that in a minute. But God, as he revealed himself to us, he shows us that he is light and his message leads us to that light. And you ever think about this? As he himself is in the light. We, if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light. So think about God in the light. You already said there's no darkness in him, but let's put it like this. If God is a source of light, as he claims to be, and he is, he can never be in darkness. Right? Do you imagine if you glowed as a human? I mean, literally, just we, if we emanated light and you wanted to get to sleep in the dark one time. You know what I'm saying? You, you'll never get there. You're, you're going to be in the light all the time if you're the source of light. Wherever God is, there's always light. His character is unchanging. Can I, we got to get a hallelujah and amen on that. And his character is unchanging. Amen. And it is good. He is holy, he is righteous, he is just, and that is unchanging. Man. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. This is what we long for as believers, as Christ followers, to be in fellowship with God, to be in close, intimate relationship, to participate with God, have true friendship but the creator of the universe. We have fellowship with him if we walk in the light. And then as a bonus, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not just as a bonus, as a necessity. See, in that light, our evil deeds are exposed. Our evil hearts are exposed. The, the longing for self-rule is exposed. But as we continue in the light and we say, God, yes, look in and, and clean this out and do this thing. It, once for all, Jesus' death on the cross paid for all of sins. And he's reminding us that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, even those we commit after we walk and enter a relationship with God. And we'll talk about how we deal with those in just a moment. But we can know that we are cleansed from sin. That means that our, our evil has been purged. We have been purified brought to a purified state before God. Hallelujah. Sin, let's, let's just have a quick word on sin. Sin is any act of wrongdoing. Any act of wrongdoing. It is any moral violation by God's standard of what is moral and immoral. It is any transgression. So anytime you break God's law, it's also any time that we don't do something he tells us we, we should do. So there's omission also, and we don't always think about that. But if we're saved by Jesus, in reality, in truth, then we're going to have fellowship with God. And I want you to know this is not a how to be saved statement. When he says, if we walk in the light, like you have to do something so that he gives you salvation. That's not what he's saying. This is what being saved looks like. If you, are, if you have entered into a true relationship with God, forgiven by the blood of Jesus, by God himself, this is what it looks like. You'll walk in the light as he himself is in the light, and you'll have fellowship with him. Isn't that an amazing promise? The people who belong to Jesus, people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus are those who walk in the light. 
And we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus from all sin, the totality of all of our sinfulness, clean, cleaned up, washed away. It's amazing. Verse 8, though, we just see if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So John has to add this if then. Are you ready for this? Verse 8, if we say we have no sin. Well, I'm walking in the light. I've got no sin. God has exposed it all, dealt with. Hallelujah, I'm good. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving others? No, we're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, that's a present tense statement. That means that we might acknowledge that we've sinned in the past, but we just don't anymore. And it's a helpful statement here because he just said we're liars if we say we're Christians yet walk in darkness. Wait a second. If I say that I'm a Christ follower, fellowshipping with God, but I walk in darkness, I'm a liar. But if I say I don't have any sin... I'm deceiving myself. What? Did you follow the conundrum there? Am I the only one that conundrumed there? (laughs) To walk in sin is to walk in darkness. But now he's saying that we're essentially liars if we say that we don't have any sin. He's saying that as long as we're in the human flesh, we're going to have sin, we're going to have sinful desires. We must not claim to be free of sin. We can claim that we're forgiven of sin. But I want you to know when we say that we, we still have sin, that we still have this, this evil desire to self-rule, and we break God's law and we break God's heart when we do, we, we, but we're forgiven, that is not for us an excuse to go, well, it's not even worth trying. Just go ahead and walk in sin, walk in dark. Oh, he said, don't walk in darkness. <laughs> but he's saying there's going to be times we're going to stumble, we're going to fall. So don't say you don't have sin, because you're deceiving yourself, ourselves. Isn't that amazing that he says that? that it, it, it's not that others are deceived. We ourselves are deceived. Guys, when it comes to a relationship with God and being forgiven, that's not what I want to be deceived. I want it to be right. And I imagine every one of us would want that to be right if we consider the consequences of not being right, correct in that. It's not others that are being deceived, it's ourselves. And then a painful knife in the side statement, and the truth is not in us. And truth comes with the article, the, the truth. And I might remind you that in in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus himself declares he's the truth. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we say we don't have sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us, Jesus is not in us, we don't want that to be true. Watch out for the temptation to believe that you don't sin anymore. I was at a pastor's conference once, and I remember hearing a pastor say, I don't sin anymore. I remember other pastors going. And when he saw the looks, he responded, well, at least not the big ones. Sin comes in many forms. Do you know God sees self-righteousness? as a sin. When we think that we have cleaned ourselves up and we're doing all right and it's all about us and what we've done to accomplish a cleaner life, I think it's disgusting to God. We don't want that to be true of us. Sin comes in many forms and whether we transgress and actually break one of God's law or we fail to do what we should do, Even speaking empty words is described as sin. Do you ever speak empty words that don't matter? The sarcasm 
the quick-witted jokes. I, I, like, can that be wrong? But ultimately, you know, what about complaining? We, we Christians, man. You know complaining is a sin, right? Being ungrateful is a sin. I mean, like, these are things that are not in faith before God, and, and yet we... I think we overlook the ways that we sin against God. It comes in many forms. So let's not be people that say, I don't sin. And ultimately, our, our heart desires self-rule and self-gratification in this flesh. And even if we clean up the visible portions of our lives to everyone else, God knows our hearts. And we will wrestle with sin as long as we're in this flesh but when he gives us a new body, I, don't, I, I get a clear picture. We won't be wrestling with sin anymore. What a glorious day that will be. So don't allow yourself to think that you no longer have sin or the inclination to sin. If we come to that point, we're deceived. So since we're going to continue to wrestle with sin, I think he gives us the next if then, verse 9. How do we deal with it? If we confess our sins. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a verse that's real popular to memorize, I think, in Awana and different programs. I memorized as a kid. I think it's been used to lead people to Christ, you know, confess your sins, come to God. I, Though that's true in an overall sense of the gospel, that we come to God recognizing we're a sinner, we're confessing that before him and accept his gift of forgiveness, I don't think this is talking to unbelievers. I think he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers who are wrestling with this journey and, and this, how do I have fellowship with God consistently and walk in that and yet fight the sin within me that wants to pull me over into the path of darkness and keep walking? No, over here, the battle. He says, if we confess our sins... See, that's what, that's what being in the light is about. When we sin, when, we, when God exposes to us, that, was, that complaining word was sin before me. That unkind word to your neighbor, that was sin before me. That act was sin. That whatever was sin. We go, yes, God, here it is. I was wrong. Clean me. Take that away. Remove it, Lord. I, I want to forsake that sin. You see, confessing is, is agreeing with God. It is, it is acknowledging that what I did, I admit, I, I did something that is punishable by you, Lord God. And, in a, and, and to an extent, it's public. If a person is wronged in our wrongdoing, I think the confession actually goes to them as well. I confess I wronged you in my words, in my action. I am sorry please forgive me. Ultimately, it's before the Lord, but I think at times we need to go to our brother and sister, or maybe even someone that's not a brother or sister in Christ, and, and say, hey, I, I think I wronged you, and I'm sorry. See, our confession isn't even that we demand forgiveness from them. It is that we acknowledge and agree that by God's standard, I wronged you. This might be one of the hardest concepts in Scripture. Easy to understand, hardest to do. We don't mind pointing out in other people, though, do we? <laughs> Man, brother, I don't want to get a name in here, so brother so-and-so. <laughs> can't believe it. I can't believe the way he talked to his children. Did you see what he, oh my word, bless his heart. We see other people sin, no problem. But we need to allow God to see that sin and to expose it, and we need to see what he sees. And we need to humble ourselves, and we need to confess our sins. And not, not to destroy us, but to grow us, to honor God. There's a promise, there's an if-then if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. 
Can we just talk about that for a second? He's faithful. I already mentioned he has unchanging character. And it's not just the first hundred years after Jesus, you know, died for them, ascended into heaven. Maybe you think, well, a hundred years is a long time for someone to have faithful character. We're talking thousands of years. We're talking eons, millions upon millions upon millions of years, because eternity is really long. He is faithful, unchanging, and his character is good, and that is profoundly important to us. He will faithfully forgive sin, doesn't matter how bad. Even if you've done the same thing again and again, and you're struggling with it, and you're tired of it, and it's kicked you down, kicked you in the teeth, he'll forgive you. He's faithful and will forgive you. But then he says righteous. He's faithful and righteous to forgive you. The word righteous, you understand, it's legally and ethically right. It's morally good, morally right. Based on his unchanging character, it's not a standard based on favoritism or anything like that. It is purely right and good. Why in the world would he forgive us based on rightness? I mean, it would make sense, wouldn't it, if he said he is faithful and compassionate and merciful and he'll forgive our sins. Why doesn't it say that? Why does it say faithful and righteous? And some of your versions may say just. Another appropriate synonym for that word. Why does it say that? I was hoping you'd have the answer. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, because God would be unrighteous. He would be unjust to accept a second payment for something that has already been paid for. Our sin in Christ has been covered by the blood of Jesus. God the Father accepted that gift, that payment on our behalf. And if he demands more from us to make that payment, he is unjust. And he doesn't do that. He is faithful and just, faithful and righteous, and will forgive us our sins. When he forgives us, he pardons us. He doesn't blame us. He releases us from the charge. He cancels the debt. He remembers our sin no more. That's where we know God isn't human. We humans remember sin. We remember other people's sin. For years. God remembers it no more. It's a choice for God. And he remembers it no more. What an amazing deity he is. This is about right standing with God as a believer. It's about knowing that we're forgiven of specific sins. It's agreeing with God about certain words, actions, and thoughts that are sinful and need to be rejected. But it is not to say that if you die having even one unconfessed sin, that you're in a state of being unforgiven and would spend an eternity in hell. We don't want to read that verse this way. It doesn't fit the message of Scripture. Again, talking to church people, to Christians, Christ followers that have received the gift of God's salvation. And God's salvation is outside of our hands. We don't control it. We need to develop in it, but we don't control it. So this is not something to bring fear that if you, if you die with one sin unconfessed that you're, you're going to spend eternity in hell. He's not saying that. Let's be clear. But it is saying as we walk with him, want to have fellowship with him in the light, those deeds have to be exposed have to be confessed. How refreshing it is to know we've been forgiven. And he doesn't stop there. He adds a little bit. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's my excitement of like a little girl. <clears throat> I have three little girls, okay? This is awesome. Uh, this is awesome. Okay, so, so we have sins we don't even know about, folks. We do. We have a lot of them. <laughs> uh, way too many. But we confess a sin that we know about that God exposed, and he, he, we confess it to him, and he's faithful and just to forgive. It's already been done. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness, things we weren't even aware about. Hallelujah. 
Can we get, I mean, come on. I just want to do it again. I can't help it. God is good. Yes. I remind myself of Miss Agnew, a 90-year-old lady back when I was like 10 years old that would sit over on the right-hand side in the second pew. My family sat on the first pew. I'd always give her a hug. Man, we would have like testimony night, and that lady would get excited about fellowship with God. And she would start telling a story, and she would start doing what I just did. She'd be like, ooh, it's so good. I just can't help it. I was just like, man, that lady is weird, but I love her. <laughs> now I'm that guy. I'm, wow. God, God is good. God is good. And then, and then he add, there's another verse in this chapter, and I actually think the next two verses in chapter two really kind of fit the same paragraph, but I'm going to stop at the end of this next one today. We'll, we'll spend more time on those two next week. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, that's almost identical to what he said like two verses ago. What's different? Well, to say we have not sinned is another tense. It's called the perfect tense. That means that we're saying that we didn't sin in the past, we're not currently sinning, and not about to begin sinning. Who can claim that? No one but God. And yet the people that were infiltrating the church were saying, no, your flesh and spirit, two separate things. So what you do in your spirit is right and good before God, but what you're doing in your flesh doesn't really matter. And I don't know if we have that teaching today, but boy, it sure, the world around us tells us, please yourself. Make make sure you're happy, make sure you're comfortable, make sure number one is taken care of. We need to be careful as Christians to make sure we are not proclaiming something that is untrue. To say we haven't sinned is to claim God-like status, and we, we do not rightfully own that. But God does. And God, as the righteous judge, gets to make the judgment about whether we've sinned or not. But in this case, remember the other one? It said, we are liars and deceiving ourselves. This one, we make him a liar. We take away from the entire message and say, God is not even needed. But God doesn't lie. We only make him appear to be a liar. And too many people reject the idea of God because they see hypocrisy in Christians like this. But when we acknowledge our sin and confess our sin and we keep striving to walk with God, we walk in the light, we're in regular fellowship with God, then we're not hypocrites. Just because we have sin doesn't make us a hypocrite. When we acknowledge, I have sinned, I have failed before God, but by the grace of God, I'm forgiven and I'm still walking with God and learning about God. He's still cleaning me up. I've still got a ways to go. Praise the Lord. I'm a work in progress. We're hypocrites when we as Christ followers in name say or even act like we have no sin and yet we still sin because of that human nature. That's hypocrisy. And again, he says his word is not in us. It said his truth, the truth is not in us, right? Same, same concept. God is not in us. His message, the truth is not in us. The word is not in us. The gospel has not taken root if that's what we act like. We might know about it, but we don't know him. And if this is you or me, I urge you to get it right with God. Come to the light. Don't fake it. Our call to action this morning is just to ask you this question. Are are you in fellowship with God? Am I in fellowship with God on a regular basis? Are we consistently practicing fellowship with God in his word, in prayer, hungering for him, confessing sin? You see, true fellowship with God doesn't pretend. It keeps searching for God to know Him, to be close with Him. It wrestles with sin honestly. We don't embrace sin, nor do we pretend like there's no sin. But we confess and expose that sin appropriately. And true fellowship with God is not, it cannot be self-righteous. We are righteous on the blood of Jesus. When was the last time that we acknowledged that we've sinned against God? Just as a self-examination, I'm not asking anyone to embarrass yourself to anybody else. I just want you to ask yourself this question. When was the last time I confessed sin to God? Even if it was just between you and God, a prayer to God saying, God, I was wrong in this. Forgive me. When was the last time? Has it been days? 
Has it been weeks? Has it been months? If it's so far that we don't even remember, how are we indeed having fellowship with God? It ought to be regular. Maybe it's just time to to get before God in his word and say, God, please start showing me my own heart again. Reveal to me the ways that I need to be corrected. Guys, if God showed us everything we needed to get fixed at once, I think we'd all quit. But God is faithful, and he reveals just what's needed at just the right time. So we need to be faithful and obedient with the little step, one at a time. God is light. When we walk with him, we walk in the light. That means our words and deeds, even our thoughts, will be exposed to examination. And we'll be in the practice of confessing and forsaking sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. I want to invite you now to bow your heads. Close your eyes. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. I just want to invite you to take a moment before the Lord. If you need to confess something to the Lord now, if you need to ask God to help you get back in that practice to start showing you, I, I believe God wants to grow each one of us in the faith. Maybe it's just needing to ask him, God, help, help me back on the path. Would you take a moment and do that in the silence? Our Father, what a good and righteous, compassionate, just, faithful God you are. I'm so thankful for your word, your light, your truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we have, even in this moment, made confession of sin, that we have invited you to be the light in our life that we practice. Help us to be consistent. God, help us not to get so discouraged when we messed up and so ashamed that we stay in the dark instead of coming back to the light. Make us a people that is pleasing to you, that looks like you. God, if there's anyone in here that has seen and heard this and they long and desire for that authenticity of fellowship with you, God, I pray you'd move in their heart to respond in faith and put their trust in you. Father, I pray you would do a marvelous work that is beyond our comprehension, but beyond our ability to understand how it came about other than it was a work of God. May that happen at Lakeside. May more people be disciples of Jesus, disciples who make disciples. And may it start, Lord, in the small beginning of just being faithful to confess sin, to pursue truth and be in fellowship with you consistently. God, we need you. So thankful that you're a God that is close. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. We pray you continue your work as we leave this place. This is what we pray, amen.